Elizabeth Melton, the Public Engagement Director for the Institute for Diversity and Civic Life, and I'm conducting interviews with the Luce Foundation's COVID-19 Emergency Grant Network for the Grounded Knowledge Project. We are meeting in the Fetzer Institute boardroom in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and Andrew Davis is our videographer. Today is Thursday, June 1st, 2023, and I am joined by Francisco Lozada. Um, will you introduce yourself some more for us, Francisco? Yes, I'm currently, I'm um, the Charles Fisher Catholic Professor of New Testament and Latinx Studies at Bright Divinity School. I also am the director of the Borderlands Institute at Bright Divinity School in Fort Worth, Texas. Thank you. Um, Let's go ahead and get started just kind of talking about the project that you did um, during the pandemic. Can you tell me a little bit about what that project was and how it unfolded? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it, um, you know, when we, uh, the Luce Foundation has been gracious in, ter in terms of helping me um, uh, fund the Borderlands Institute prior to the COVID-19 rapid um, response networking grant. Um, and so we received the email from the Luce Foundation and they asked if we were, would be willing to distribute a certain a number of, of, I guess, sub-grants to a number of organizations. Prior to that, I think the Luce Foundation would have known that, uh, through my reports that we've networked very well along the border, particularly the southern border, particularly around the El Paso region um, and so I've established a number of um, relationship with a number of nonprofit organizations, humanitarian but also religious rel related, over the years. Uh, well, since since the the the, um, the start of the grant back then, but the rapid uh, COVID nineteen rapid um, response grant was um, was put you know was you know put forward to us and. Um, and so we we embraced the 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 welcome, or I guess the challenge and whatnot, and um, and it's been a really wonderful experience since then. So I've, I've been able to create collaborations among um, a number of organizations, and so it's um, so yeah. That's I don't know if, it, if I can say more, but it's 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 that's what got it going a little bit. So. Yeah, if you'd share, can you tell me some more about some of these different organizations and kind of these different, um, the communities that they serve that you were able to work with? Yeah, so so once once we got the invitation to do the grant, let me back up a little bit. So we immediately put together a, um, you know, I worked on putting together a, a, I don't know, procedure on how to distribute the, fu the funding. So uh, we created a committee and it consisted of my uh, president at the time, New Williams, um, and it consisted of Irasema, Dr. Irasema Coronado, professor of political science and director of the Transborder Studies program at Arizona State University. We began to uh, meet and uh, evaluate, uh, not, not so much to evaluate, but put together a proposal uh, or an application process that we can distribute it to a number of our connections or networks. What's very vital when you're meeting, when you're when you're interacting with migrant communities, immigration is is to have a level of trust. And uh, Dr. Coronado allowed that because of her research has been really engaged with uh, migrant children and women and a number of organizations in the El Paso region. So um, that's how it got, we began to mobilize and put that together. Um, and then we began to sort of target a, a number of organizations along the border from Brownsville to Nogales, um, Arizona. And um, and we incur we had two two source subgrants. We had a five thousand. We had a ten thousand dollar subgrant. And what we decided to do after learning a few things is that they needed more money during this time. That's the one thing I one, well I learned a lot of things. But one of the things COVID nineteen taught us was the disparity of e economics, right? Um, and so we encouraged them to apply for the ten thousand dollar grant um, that they were um, eligible for. 
And so we put that committee together and, um, and we started targeting people and we began to receive the applications. Another thing I really learned about that was that even though we had to comply with certain financial uh, policies by our institution, and not a lot of the nonprofits or some of the religious based organizations knew how to put their financial uh, records in order. It's, financial literacy was one of the things that I've learned that, that um, was lacking with a, non, a lot of nonprofits. And so we try, to, we try to connect them with another institution that can serve as fiduciary sponsors. Um, and it didn't always work, but in some cases it did work. And, um, and so, so again, I mean, the, the organizations varied in um, many ways, from homelessness in some ways to um, w we funded a organization in Phoenix who simply a work center who needed uh, cell phones. And cell phones in many ways will connect these, uh, many of these people to their family members here and there but also keep them updated on medical issues, um, the health issues that were facing, they were facing at the same time. Food was a major thing, was the number one thing that people needed was food. So we provided, um, it, we, we didn't put any sort of stipulations on who would receive it. I mean, so we did give it to the Borderlands Rainbow Center was the LGBTQIA organization in El Paso. We funded them a van to take food to a variety of different places um, at during the COVID period. Um, that's one thing. We did a gen, um, another organization in South Texas, also LGBTQIA, who provided, used the funds to create food packages for for their respective communities. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, um, another Kino Border Institute in Nogales also received funding. Um, the Good Samaritan Center in, in South Texas also did in many ways. But food, food and health um, cleansing um, items, but also things that we may not normally know, such as um, you know, the, the, the needs that perhaps a woman migrant might, might need that's different than men. And that sort sort of thing. So it's it's um, we funded a Mennonites uh, church down in San Antonio um, that was doing phenomenal work, just phenomenal work. Um, and um, oh, there's just a host of other other organizations. About 15 in general is what we we funded over. All the grants were around 10,000. There's a few that received a little bit more, and some that few you know received a few few um, a little bit less. It, it is. It's such an amazing range, and thinking about it too, mm -hmm. from um, you know, like an academic researcher standpoint, it's it's interesting because so many of those communities, obviously, some like you know, from an IRB perspective, mm -hmm. very high risk. Right, right, um, right, right. But right, it's right. like a very different relationship yeah. that you got to kind of encounter and work with them. Yeah. Um, yeah. In this situation. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I was wondering if you could speak to that. Are there some of these organizations, have you been able to maintain relationships mm -hmm. or continue that work in a, in a new way? Or Yeah, I mean, the Borderlands Rainbow Center in El Paso, Texas is one that we've stayed in touch with over the years. I take st When we do travel seminars, I still take students there. Um, an organization we didn't fund, but they, knew, they didn't um, at the time need the money. <laughs> Uh, they're funded by the Diocese of El Paso, but we still establish a relationship with them as the Hope Border Institute. Um, um, and that's been, um, I've been able to link other people from the grant there and vice versa. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's, um, those two come to mind. Um, uh, the Good Samaritan Center in South Texas uh, is another one. Um, so yeah, I think the networking in retrospect, was uh, I, um, if Luce was trying to connect networking, it worked because I have a number my 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 network on that on that um, um, in South Texas has been wonderful. Actually, um, Abera Ciudad Nueva. There's Abera slash Ciudad Nueva is another organization that we funded, and they they house um, 
shelter for migrant people, um, on the, people on the move. Um, and we just met with them this past January in El Paso as well. So, um, and the executive director there is phenomenal. Um, so it's, it's um, all that being said, it's, it's, that's I think one of the key ingredients is that it created community in many ways. And I, at the Borderlands Institute, do these webinar series. Um, and I've noticed some of those people on, on, um, during the webinar series, um, um, a webinar series that deals with the realities of, of um, people on the move. And it's, um, but a lot of that networking, I was, I've, I've recognized the names uh, who participate in those webinars. So, so. but it's a very, it's a very interesting what has what I have not really reflected on a little bit. Well, I have reflected on it. I haven't written on it. It's what goes on during that. There is um, what I've given you is all the surface. There's another element of that exists when you are distributing funds, and that is the issue of power um, that comes in. Who who. Who deserves it? Who does not deserve it? And that was something that was really problematic for my. I had to think carefully about that, and it was really. It still to this day bothers me about that because the power behind humanitarian aid is something that needs further reflection in my field, um, and the power that I had in who can receive that or not. That that's something that I was very uncomfortable with. But I set up a, you know, I tried my best and set up a criteria and try to adhere to that. Um, and I and I see it, that experience has made me more cognizant of humanitarian aid, the question of humanitarian aid at the global level. Which refugees receives what and, and why, you know, which ones don't. So, I mean, that's the thing that I've been thinking philosophically about um, in the back of my, you know, in the back of my head. It's, it's the humani humanitarian aid, wh whatever you want to call it, is, is, has power issues involved. And it needs to be, for me as an academic, needs to be um, interrogated, I guess, for lack of a better term. But, um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, yeah, definitely that question of ethics and power. Yeah at yeah. that large level but then yeah. I also hear you talking about two kind of on kind of in the micro or logistics level this question of like that financial literacy mm -hmm. right which is kind yeah. of another yeah. barrier yeah. or another hidden behind the veil right. aspect for right. so many organizations right. yeah. Um, yeah. I was wondering if you could speak more to that of what that partnership with some of these I guess they were the grantee applications or had they already been approved for the Grant, well, but you needed more. Yeah. So, for example, there's a there's a, a um, organization in El Paso. I, I'm not going to get the name correctly, but it's it, it's an organization that's it provides um, all sorts of support for migrant farm workers. So every morning, a number of farmer workers will show up at their center. Actually, you can probably see their center from the news these days um, in the background, and they have some sort of visa. I, I don't know exactly the visa, but they they're agri it's the agricultural visa. And they come and they show up and they go to New Mexico to pick whatever they're picking um, in, in that regard. They were doing phenomenal work. The work that they were doing anchors back to the civil rights movement, uh, to the Bracero movement. Um, and, um, but the, and even though the executive director was well-known in the area, but also well-known internationally, I couldn't get them... <laughs> Get them their, uh, I forget their forms that they, I can't remember all the forms now. Um, I couldn't get them to supply the correct financial forms for TCU, Bright Divinity TCU. Um, and so eventually, uh, my colleague from Arizona State University, Irasema, says, okay, can we link them to another organization that uh, could, could be their fin fiduciary sponsor? And that way we can still give them the, you know, the, uh, the Agricultural Migrant Worker Center um, the funding. And that's what we did. But it took a lot of work. And I learned a lot about that. I, did, I didn't know. I, I mean, I was, I was new information for me as well. But, um, but one of the things I always left is, man, nonprofits need 
fiduciary financial literacy. I did not realize that. I just assumed that they would, because some of the organizations I had had a grant writer, had a has someone who's volunteering, um, who has finance background. This center didn't have that, but they're doing phenomenal work. I mean, the students always came back from hearing about their stories, the stories that they shared about migrant workers, um, just transformed them in many ways. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that I think I've learned through this whole, whole process is uh, that nonprofits do need need to, you know, they need a, a really strong support staff. Uh, otherwise, they, they, they will struggle. Yes, there are so <laughs> many <laughs> different <laughs> issues and obviously yeah. bureaucratic layers, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. particularly that comes out of the money. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've still got a little bit more time, and so mm -hmm. I want to ask you, um, to think about, if, you know, with this kind of being an archive for future mm -hmm. scholars, future generations, mm -hmm. as as a academic, as a researcher, mm -hmm. as someone kind of who's had a background in doing this type of work and working with organizations, mm -hmm. what was something that you learned um, during this time that maybe surprised you or that you didn't expect? I mean, it sounds like you just also shared something like that, yeah, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, I mean, the, the financial illiteracy was a surprise. I think for me it's more more philosophical. It's just the 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 whole process of distribution of funds, which I've alluded to already, um, the power dynamics that go in. I mean, it's. Let me see if I can share a story real quick. So so you can talk to someone on the border, who's crossing the border, who's seeking asylum, for example, and and this is what these organizations are dealing with on a daily basis. Um, and a woman's, let's say a woman's coming through and she is claiming that she was raped. How do you prove that? How do you prove that to a border patrol agent? You see? And it's, it's you know, does she undress herself? Does she show her? It's the, the vulnerability in, the, in what migrants go through to get just asylum. Here they're, you know, the, you know, and all that power is rest on border patrol agents, for the lack of a better term. But, um, um, but it's it's that's the thing. When I began to, you know, um, talk to some of the directors and what they were hearing, they were traumatized. And in in hearing their stories, I get traumatized at a certain different degree. A distant degree in many ways you hear over and over and over again it does impact you mentally uh, physically in many different ways um, and these grants I mean I I've read I've read their proposals and that's what I was experiencing is the trauma that these people were going through during COVID-19 um, and it was hard reading. I, I just still remember some of them. Just it was just really, really hard. And um, you're there in tears, you know, reading these stories of, of um, and these people are seeking, you know, um, ten thousand dollar sub grants. I felt like I wanted to give them more, but I, it wasn't more money there. But I think that's where Loose has been has done wonderful work. I mean, in many ways. I mean, it's it's. Um, um, it's exposed me to that world. Um, it's created network, um, and hopefully we've done some some good things. We put together a a video uh, called Testimonials. And testimonials can be found on the Bright Divinity's uh, YouTube page. That sort of um, does a video. Um, I had a student assistant, and we began to um, keeping IRB. Um, parameters in place or you know whatever um, you know we asked them to supply us what they felt comfortable supplying us in terms of pictures and whatnot so I think um, and we um, Yari Martinez um, is the one who put that together a student of mine um, and um, so yeah I think that's that's something that I've also I think I've learned in many ways is the respect of their dignity 
irrespective of our identity. Um, and, you know, so, um, yeah, and that's where Ira Sema, Dr. Coronado at Arizona State University was very helpful because uh, Ira Sema is very IRB centered given that she does um, qualitative research. So it's, it's important. So I, I put people in place for certain reasons to keep me in check, but also to make sure we are respecting their privacy. And so some many of the pictures you won't see their faces, but you'll you'll see bodies and other things. So, but yeah, so, yeah. So overall, I think it was it's been a, it's 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 an experience that I've written on a little bit, um, and it's, so it's filtered into some of my research writing a little bit um, um, over the last couple of years. So, but um, and I've footnoted. Uh, the testimonials and a couple other things over the years, but it's also gotten me in touch with, with a number of other um, um, networking um, within the loose family, if you want to call it that. So, yeah, that, I mean that does again going back to your earlier um, comment, kind of about that network, right? It is, mm -hmm. it's about kind of almost trickle down networks that then are able to kind of back in yeah. the larger. Yeah. I mean, that's how I knew Tiffany. I mean, Jonathan put me in, tough, in touch with Tiffany. Mm -hmm. And he saw what Tiffany was doing, so he says, hey, why don't you, you know, he recommended my name to be on one of their um, committees. And so that's, that's, that's the link there. Um, and then we met together in these COVID sort of Zoom meetings, and I met people from P, uh, PRI or PRII. PRRI um, and um, other organizations and so we have like minds and uh, we all have very committed to the the marginalized and the vulnerable whatever that might mean mean today so well I think with that we're right at time okay so, so we'll wrap up but thank you so much um, yeah. for chatting with me today thanks you thank you very very much thank you